You are listening to Women's Running Stories. Women's Running Running. Women's Running Stories. Uh, My name is Amelia Benton. I am a freelance journalist, primarily focusing on running, health, and fitness. I live in my hometown of Houston, Texas with my husband, Omar, and our Boston Terrier Rescue Astro. Yes, this episode features journalist and runner Amelia Benton. And this story will focus on Amelia's marathon journey up through qualifying for the Boston Marathon and running the goal race itself. It's a story of Amelia discovering her own unique needs as a runner and the importance of working with people who listen to those needs. But before we hear more from Amelia, I want to welcome you to Women's Running Stories, the podcast where exceptional women runners share stories about their running experiences. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am the host and producer of Women's Running Stories, and this podcast is a proud member of the Evergreen Network of Podcasts. I do want to remind you that Women's Running Stories will be live and in person at the Boston Marathon Expo this Sunday. I am once again joining my good friends Lisa and Julie from the Run Farther and Faster podcast, and we are going to be doing a live recording in conversation with three exceptional women. We're co-hosting a panel called Making a Statement, Breaking Barriers in Women's Running, and the runners who will be on the panel are Kelly Bruno, Elisa Harvey, and Bree Bomer. Each of these outstanding runners has broken barriers in women's running that inspire them to compete with a purpose that goes beyond race day. The panel is taking place this Sunday, April 14th at 2 p.m. on the live stage at the Boston Marathon Expo. If you can join us, please do. It is going to be a terrific conversation. We are all really excited. If you do miss it, however, like in years past, the conversation will be recorded and it will become an episode on each of the podcasts who are going to be there, Women's Running Stories and Run Farther and Faster. All right, now on to Amelia's story. Amelia Benton is a well-recognized journalist in the running world with a particular focus on professional runners and runners who have typically been underrepresented in the media. And yes, as a runner, a big focus of Amelia's has been on marathons. She's run over a dozen of them, and for about a decade, her efforts focused on what many ambitious marathoners focus on, getting a Boston qualifying time, or as it's called, a BQ, and then running the Boston Marathon. Over the course of her marathoning journey, Amelia has become astutely aware of her own needs as a runner. She's discovered, in some cases, that what generally works for many other athletes just didn't work for her. She's been through a lot of trial and error, and she has found what does work for her, and also a coach who backed her approach. And that coach is Nell Rojas. Nell is both a coach and, yes, she is also one of America's very best marathoners. Among many accolades, Rojas has twice been the top American finisher at the Boston Marathon. So getting to the heart of it, Amelia Benton's story is about learning how to train for and race marathons in the ways that work best for her. It's about understanding what did and didn't work and trusting what she learned. This is also to say that there is never one right, perfect way to approach marathons. And even when you found something that works, it can change depending on weather, the course, and of course we all change as we get older. And this very dynamic situation is one of the things that makes marathoning so frustrating and also so eternally interesting. One detail to understand before we get going here has to do with pacing. 
Amelia talks about negative splits, positive splits, and even pacing. And simply put, this is how we talk about how fast runners run each part of a race. Negative splits means that you run the first part of a race slower than the second part of the race. Positive splits are just the opposite. You run faster in the beginning and slower toward the end. And even splits means you run the same pace throughout. There are various opinions about which strategy is best. Most people will agree that the positive split typically isn't the greatest approach. Many people firmly believe in even splits. Lots of people abide by the golden rule of the negative split. But as with so many things in running, what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. And it also depends on the terrain and the distance. I suspect that pacing strategy will continue to be a hotly debated topic for many years to come. Also, Amelia mentions some things in her story that I want to just be clear on. She mentions the NYRR, which is the New York Roadrunners. They put on the New York City Marathon and a lot of other events throughout the year. They are a huge running organization in New York City. She also mentions the majors, which refers to the six biggest marathons in the world, Tokyo, New York, Chicago, London, Berlin, and Boston. And she mentions Alison Mariella Desir's book, Running While Black. Running While Black is a seminal book about running in the United States, told from a black perspective. And Alison Mariella Desir told her story on Women's Running Stories when her book first came out, and I will link to that episode in the show notes. And I recommend her book, Running While Black is an Important Read. About the Boston Marathon itself, Amelia mentions the Wellesley Scream Tunnel, which is at the halfway point of the course when it passes by the all-female school of Wellesley. This is a spot really well known for its cheering. It is terrifically loud. You can hear it long before and long after you pass through it. Also, Amelia talks about the policing of Mile 21 at the 2023 Boston Marathon. And I will briefly explain what happened. The cheer zone at Mile 21 of the Boston Marathon for years now has been organized by the Trailblazers and Pioneers Run Crew, two of the Boston area's leading groups created by and primarily for Black runners and runners of color. Their cheer zone is another well-known spot on the course that brings terrific energy and enthusiasm. They bring the joy at a point where runners are typically really struggling. Last year and the year before, the police were called about the way this group was cheering. And in 2023, that resulted in the cheer zone being surrounded by the police front and back during the marathon. This incident continues to reverberate even to today, and there really hasn't been a clear resolution. The policing of Mile 21 has been a topic on this podcast before, and in particular, I will link to Liz Rock's episode. Liz is one of the co-founders of the Trailblazers, and the policing at Mile 21 had a big impact on her running story. I will also link to Amelia's article about this incident, which she mentions in the episode. All right, now we are ready. So let's get to it. Let's hear Amelia Benton's running story focused around her marathon journey to the Boston Marathon. Here to tell her story, starting at the beginning of her running journey, is Amelia Benton. So I've been running for a very long time. I first started running in high school and I didn't start running longer distances until I was in college. I went to college in New York. I went to Hofstra University in Long Island, which is very close to New York City. So I did several New York Roadrunners races while I was in college and I quickly became familiar with the programs they offered, which includes their nine plus one program where you can qualify to run the New York City Marathon. Uh, the year before you would want to run the marathon where you run nine of their races uh, within the calendar year before you want to run the marathon and volunteer at one. So I actually started 
working on completing that program. During my senior year of college, I ran my first half marathon with my twin sister in Central Park during our senior year of college. So when we were 21, we ran the Manhattan Half Marathon in Central Park uh, on a very cold January day. And then I didn't do any more races until after I graduated that spring. So from June through December of 2009, I ran my remaining eight races to qualify and prepare to run the 2010 New York City Marathon. And while I was in college, I was a journalism major. So it was kind of a requirement to follow, you know, follow local and national news. So I was very accustomed to reading like the New York Times every day and every weekend. So that was where I got kind of familiar with the pro running scene because there was heavy coverage around the New York City Marathon every year. So that was kind of when I started first following like the pro running scene and like kind of these big milestones that recreational runners might pursue, like uh, like eventually qualifying for the Boston Marathon. So I would say I had that on my radar pretty much from then, like even before I ran my first marathon. And when I was training for my first marathon, I wasn't very knowledgeable about what it took to train for a big goal like that. I pretty much did it all on my own. Like I found a free training plan on the, on the New York Roadrunners website and kind of followed that on my own. Um, I feel like the social media scene wasn't really what it is today. So people weren't like randomly finding runners, you know, on, on the internet, like on Twitter and Instagram, like a lot of people do now. So I didn't really know many other people who were running at the same level as me. So I pretty much did it all on my own. And so I ran that first marathon really not knowing what I was doing. Uh, I ran, I would say I ran a pretty respectable time for a first marathon. My first marathon was a 409, but I mean, I did everything wrong. I PR'd the half marathon by about 12 minutes. So you can, <laughs> so you can imagine how the second half went. I ran a very big positive split. And I also didn't take any gels in the race because I didn't really know anything about nutrition. But, you know, I don't remember ever feeling like feeling horrible during the race. I just remember having fun the whole time because, I mean, when you do a race like New York, it's your first marathon. Like you can't really ask for more than that kind of atmosphere. So I think I was just running on fumes and running on adrenaline the whole time. And I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember it sucking at all. So I finished you know, feeling very happy with how it turned out and being pretty familiar with the Boston Marathon goal that many people have. I immediately set my sights on that. Um, I knew I wanted to run a qualifier eventually, and I think I got a little ahead of myself. Like after that, I had a few marathons that didn't quite go so well, even though I might have been a little more prepared and more knowledgeable about how to train for them and how to execute races. I feel like I still had a lot to learn. I think I would say, I mean, I've run 13 marathons to date and most of them have gone badly. And I think for most of them, I did kind of get ahead of myself and tried to go after goals that I wasn't necessarily physically or mentally prepared to tackle just yet. I probably really could have benefited from using a coach much earlier than I ever did. I think one of the main things that I had to learn was not running my training runs, like my easy runs and my long runs. Uh, too fast. I feel like that's a mistake that a lot of people have to learn the hard way. And I feel like that's, that is something that you have to learn the hard way in order to figure it out. You know, even now, even though I've, brought, I've qualified for Boston now, my fastest marathon is a 3.30, which is eight minute pace. Even now, I still don't do my easy runs or my long runs faster than 9.20 pace. So I'd say that's one of the biggest lessons. And a few years ago, you know, I got caught up in the fact that it seemed like, well, even to this day, it seems like everyone at my level runs much higher volume every week and much higher overall mileage than I do. And it's taken a lot of trial and error for me to figure out that I'm someone who performs better on lower mileage and lower volume and more quality focused workouts. And, you know, I've tried, I've experimented with higher mileage peaking at like 65 miles, maybe more. And I ran the worst marathon of my life that year. I showed up overcooked and overtrained that year. So I think that's been one of the biggest lessons that you know, what works for one person might not necessarily work for another. And that was the main reason why I hired Nell or when I first heard about Nell, because I heard her talking on a podcast after she won, I believe it was the 2019 Grandma's Marathon. And she talked about how at that time she was training at a much lower volume than most runners at her level. And that actually 
inspired an article that I wrote for Runner's World on why some runners might benefit from training at lower volume. And I actually used her as one of my expert sources. And we kept in touch after that. And that's when I decided to hire her. And I've been working with her for, I guess, about two and a half years now. And I feel like she particularly has a big has been a big game changer in my running journey. And I feel like she, even though, you know, running is, it's literally her job and it is her life. I feel like she gets it that I'm a normal person who has like, has other responsibilities in life. And sometimes life happens and I'm not able to execute the training exactly how she writes it. Some days I have to move days around. Some days I might have to cut the mileage back slightly. And I feel like that's important because if you're just doing it on your own, you might get too caught up in the fact in when you might not be able to do something exactly as planned when in the end, like having to move a workout around or having to cut a run short is not going to make or break how your race turns out. One other thing that was important to me when I was deciding what coach to work with, it was important to me to, to pick a coach who was also a woman of color. And with Nell, like fitting that bill and also being a Latina who hadn't gotten as much media attention as as people, many people at her level at the time, that was important to me as well. And I say all the time now that I feel really lucky that I got in with Nell when I did, because this was before she even ran Boston for the first time, before she was the top American there twice in a row. As a person and runner of color myself, I'm, I know what that's like to not necessarily get my voice heard. And I, you know, when I was going back to when I was trying to pursue the goal to qualify for Boston, I had a lot of people, you know, express skepticism when I shared that that was my goal. And, and I don't know if that's necessarily what, if that's why it was, if it's because a lot of people who line up in Boston every year don't necessarily look like me, or if it was because, you know, that going back to that lesson that I said I had to learn the hard way of train of learning to train at a much slower pace than what I might want to race at. I feel like that's, I feel like a lot of people might see my, see my training paces at Strava and might not necessarily expect such lofty goals of from me. Amelia had had lofty goals from the start of her journey, but it did take time for her to get through the common mistakes like running her easy runs too fast, and then also to discover what worked best for her. At the time she found Rojas, Amelia also knew what she needed from a coach. Yes, she wanted to work with a woman of color. Amelia is also Latina. And she wanted to work with someone who would back her on what she'd already learned about herself. I actually had already gone back to lower mileage at that point, and I had run a couple of more PRs since then. You know, I already knew that I already knew I could run well on lower mileage, and I'd talked to other coaches about potentially working with them. And I even had one coach tell me, like, it, like you're going to have to build your mileage up. There's no way you're going to qualify for Boston if you don't get your mileage over 60 miles. And I knew that wasn't true. And when I when I trained for that VQ with Nell, I peaked at 50 miles in a week, and I only did that one time for one week. The Coach Athlete Trust was established. Rojas scheduled the mileage that Amelia needed, and Amelia had confidence in the workouts Rojas wrote for her. When I was training to BQ, Nell had me do quite a few runs, like long runs with like big chunks of mileage at marathon pace. And I think that was a big game changer because, you know, marathon pace should not feel impossible on the day. And once you've done enough, like enough big chunks and big stretches at that pace, it is more mental than anything. These key fitness and confidence boosting workouts proved to be great preparation as did a well-timed tune-up race just before her BQ marathon attempt. The last half marathon that I ran before I ran my BQ marathon, I did a half marathon in College Station, Texas, that was supposed to be more of a training effort. I ended up running a 141 high that day, so uh, about two two minutes slower than my half PR at the time. But the the goal with that race, uh, it was... In total, it was going to be a 16-mile day, so I ran a three-mile warm-up before the race, and Nell's goal for me that day was to start at marathon pace, to start like around 7.55 to 8-minute pace, and then run like a really strong negative split to the end, and I ran the last 5K of that race around 7.20 to 7.25 pace, which I had never run any miles in a half marathon that fast before, so that was a huge confidence booster leading into the 
marathon um, since I'd never run, I'd never run a race like that before. And after Nell reviewed my data from that race, like she said, like, this makes it obvious that you're ready for the BQ and and it's going to happen. So I was really happy with that day. And in fact, Nell Rojas was spot on. When Amelia lined up at the Houston Marathon in January of 2022, she was ready to get that BQ she'd been aiming toward for years. When I showed up to run the Houston Marathon in 2022, it was the first, I would say it was the first time that I felt more excited than nervous about running the marathon. And I felt prepared. I felt like that, you know, it was a perfect weather day. I felt very well trained for it. And I felt like there really wasn't anything standing in my way from being able to do it that day. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. The training done, all that was left was to attend to some final race day details. Nell asked me if I wanted to run a warm up before that marathon, and I said, No, I don't want to run anything more than 26 miles that day. And, <laughs> and I feel like the first couple of miles, if we're going to start a little bit slower, that should serve as a warm up itself. And she said that was fine. And You know, if you do that, then once you finally kick it into high gear and settle into your pace, it will feel easier. And as you slowly start to bring it down after the first half, those last few miles should feel more effortless. And if you're running a positive split, I mean, I can tell you, I'm sure most people have experienced it anyway, like those last few miles where you're, where you might basically be jogging are not going to feel effortless. You know, I have so much experience at this point and I've tried it pretty much every single way. I've run a lot of marathons where I've run the worst positive splits of my life. And I've and I've run so many marathons where I've attempted even splits and it has never worked out for me. My best marathons have been the ones where I've started out super conservatively and run a pretty big negative split. Before I ran my BQ, I ran the, the 2019 Houston Marathon in 345, which which based on like my half marathon PR at the time, it was a pretty pretty soft PR at the time, but I was really proud of that race because I hadn't had a good training season leading up to it. And more than anything, when I showed up on race day, I wanted to have a good race, even if it didn't end up being a PR that, that day. But because I executed it the way that I did, I ended up running a three minute negative split and a four minute PR. So I was really happy with that. So when I was working with Nell, and we were talking race strategy. I told her like, I've run, so far I've run my best marathon ever with a negative split strategy and I want to replicate that for this. And she agreed with me. She said, there's no money in the bank in a marathon. There's no money in the bank in the marathon. Said another way, the strategy of trying to bank minutes, of trying to run faster in the beginning of a race with the idea that you'll slow down toward the end and quote unquote, spend those minutes is, like I mentioned before, rarely successful. This is that positive split strategy. And this was certainly true for Amelia. So Amelia had her negative split strategy in place. She was fit, rested, and ready to go. And she got a few final encouraging words from Coach Rojas. Yeah, so Nell told me the night before the race, the night before the race was actually the first time that we ever met in person. She was in town to run the half marathon. And later that night, she texted me, you can run eight minute pace all damn day. And I, you know, I kind of already knew that for myself based on the the training runs that we'd done together. But it was a really great feeling to hear her say that. And that was the mantra that I repeated to myself, like, like all throughout the race. And so, you know, I started the, that marathon at around 8.45 pace, even though the goal to average was eight minute pace. And it went pretty much exactly according to plan. I ran a two minute, two minute negative split that day. Like all throughout the first 20 miles, I 
I repeated to myself, you can run eight minute pace all damn day. And when I finally got to that last 5K stretch on Allen Parkway, it, it turned into, you can run eight minute pace for one more 5K for 20 more minutes for one more mile. Even though I knew I was going to run a huge PR and it was pretty clear that the BQ was going to happen like from mile 20, I didn't really let myself believe it until mile 24. And that's when I told myself like, today is the day it's really going to happen. And when I finished, um, you know, it was really emotional. You know, I've shared that story with so many people and most people are still skeptical of the negative split strategy. Most people swear by, by even splits, but I would really encourage anyone to give it a try. You'll probably surprise yourself. I know it's, it sounds easier said than done and it can be hard to believe, but it's so much easier to run, to pick it up and run faster in the last 5K than to slog through a finish where, you, where you've run the worst positive split of your life. Yeah, and the last 5K of the Houston Marathon are on Allen Parkway, which is like this, uh, this like roadway that has a few dips and inclines. Or most, they're like underpasses, so they're pretty much nothing. So people always, who, people who haven't run the Houston Marathon before, will ask like, how, like, what does that feel like? Like, how do I approach it? And I always say that if you've run a smart race, you really shouldn't notice the dips and inclines on that part. And I always say like, try the positive slip because wouldn't you rather feel like you're flying and not dying on Allen Parkway? <laughs> Amelia did fly in those last 5K, executing a solid negative split. She'd been fueled by a training approach that worked for her, supported by a coach who understood the types of workouts and preparation she needed to reach her goal, and Amelia had been armed with a race strategy that she had confidence in. And it all added up to the fact that she had done it. She'd earned her Boston qualifier and with that, her entry into the 2023 Boston Marathon. I was mostly just looking forward to the experience. I was there with a lot of friends from Houston. Many of them, it was their first Boston too. Uh, I knew it would be a very different race day experience from, from running Houston and from other races that I've done, mainly because of the late start time. Uh, I was in the third wave of runners, so I started at almost 11 a.m., <laughs> which was very unfamiliar territory for me for someone who's used to starting her long runs at around 6 a.m. So 11 a.m. felt more <laughs> like lunchtime to me, and I felt like that was kind of it was kind of the waiting game that went in with that was kind of a struggle. And I found a friend from Houston to ride the bus down to Hopkinton with because I feel like if I had you know boarded the bus alone and not maybe not had anyone to talk to I probably just would have like sat there nervously alone with my thoughts and it was good to have someone there with me to just to kind of take the edge off and talk about what we were excited about even if it didn't have to do with the race that day. My husband also ran it was his first Boston Marathon too so that actually made it extra special for us to get to experience it for the first time together but he's also much faster than me he his qualifying time was a 301 so he was in the first wave of runners starting uh I guess about an hour before me. So we got up at 5 a.m. together so he could get ready. So we had like our coffee together and helped, I helped him like get his breakfast ready before he took off. And then I had a little more time to kill myself before, before getting on the bus, at, I guess around eight or so myself. Um, and then once I found my friend and we got on the bus together, I think it was about an hour drive down to Hopkinton, which I didn't really... I didn't really know it took that long to get there. And once we got there, I also didn't realize that it's about a mile walk from the buses to the starting line. Um, so, I, so I think that's something that's something that's good to know. And I would I would think a lot of runners would want to know about that, too, because <laughs> I guess that's like that's a lot more time on your feet than you might anticipate before running the marathon. Uh, but once we got there, um, it was raining. So we tried to get into a tent like under a tent as quickly as we could to avoid getting too wet before the race. And then, you know, just like had our second breakfast and, you know, used the bathroom as many times as we could before the race. And even though it was, it was a long time from when I woke up that morning until I started the race, I felt like once we got to the village, the time went by really quickly. And before I knew it, it was time to run. 
you know, I didn't know too much about the course before I ran it. And it was an interesting time for me to finally run the race because I'm when I was preparing for the Boston Marathon was around when Allison Mariella Desir's book Running While Black came out. And she and I actually interviewed her about the book shortly before it came out. And I was closely following a lot about her experience when she ran the race and what she was posting around the race. And it really made me think critically about why I wanted to run this race so much and why this goal had been so important to me all these years. And a big thing that she had talked about was, you know, the fact that this race doesn't actually run like much of the course isn't through the actual city of Boston. It's mostly through these super white suburbs and, you know, the race itself. Like even now the field is not, is still not very diverse at all. And that's something that I was very conscious about on the starting line. I could see that I was one of very few runners who was not, who was not white in my corral. Uh, So all of that really made me think critically about the experience. And I guess, yeah, that's something that I was really paying attention to as I ran the race. And a part that really stood out to me was when we came through the Wellesley Scream Tunnel. And actually, like I took note that there actually were a lot of students of color out there cheering. And I thought that was really cool. <laughs> and, you know, something that that kind of bubbled up, I guess, in the aftermath of the race was what happened at mile 21 with the police presence around the cheer stations for the Pioneers Run Crew and the Trailblazers. And actually a publication approached me to write about that after, after the race, they actually asked me to find someone from one of the clubs to write and as told to from their perspective about what happened that day. And so I ended up interviewing Sid Baptista, who created the Pioneers Run Crew. And actually the first publication, the publication that approached me to write about it ultimately ended up their legal team ended up killing the story. So I had to find a second home for it. And I'm very grateful that Runner's World picked it up. And I had already interviewed Sid for a story a couple of years before that. So I already, uh, you know, already had formed a relationship with him. So he was very eager to talk about that. And I was really happy that Runner's World gave him, gave us the platform to put that story out there. Bringing her thoughtful, critical eye to her Boston experience, Amelia was seeing for herself what this experience feels like from her point of view. And this experience and Amelia's journalism focus did make her a clear choice to cover the policing at mile 21. Getting back to the marathon, Amelia was there to represent for other women of color, and she was there to live the Boston Marathon experience herself, to see the giant neon Sitco sign which looms large at the end of the race, to take those final famous turns, right on Hereford, left on Boylston, into the finishing stretch. And of course, she had done all of the training to get there with race day goals in mind. Goal-wise, you know, initially I thought maybe I would be able to chase another PR at Boston. And once the training cycle really got going, it became, it became clear that I wasn't I still wasn't back in the same place that I was before when I was training for the goal fitness wise. And so I thought maybe I could still be Q again at Boston. And I did my best to kind of train for the course. I did a few hilly long runs when I could here in Houston. Ultimately, I don't feel like it was enough. I think I should have also focused more on downhill training. So I think the course at Boston kind of kicked my butt. But I do remember vividly seeing the Sitco sign and it being a lot further away than I thought it would be. Like, I think that was, I'm pretty sure that's like well before mile 25, but you're well past mile 25 when you finally pass it. Um, But I mean, it was cool to finally get to see that milestone. And then of course that riot on Hereford and left on Boyle's, I mean, the riot on Hereford felt pretty iconic because that's the part that you hear everyone talk about and so you know it was easy to get excited about that and know that I was about to finish the Boston Marathon but then when you make the left on Boylston like you still have a long way to go I think you still have like 0.4 miles or so to go so you're not quite sprinting just yet but I mean those are still those are still moments that I think a lot of people will remember of the day when they do it. I 
ended up finishing Boston in around 3.52, which was pretty off my PR, more than 20 minutes. But ultimately, even though that was, you know, that was another positive split race, which isn't my favorite to run, I could still walk away happy with my performance there because it was a much much tougher course than I'd run in many years. And, you know, even though the last five miles were kind of a struggle, I didn't slow down that much in the race. So in the end, I wasn't, I wasn't disappointed with my time. I was, you know, I was proud that I ended up doing it and proud to have finished. And I can't really be disappointed with how the day turned out. More than anything, I wanted to enjoy the experience because I knew it might be the only time I ever run that race, even though I'm hoping to still run another PR. I don't know if I'm ever going to run Boston again. So I really wanted to savor the experience. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people (laughs) walk away from Boston when it didn't go as planned and they feel like they have to come back as soon as possible and get revenge on the course. And I feel like, I mean, I still want to run another marathon PR. So if I PR again, then that would obviously be another BQ and I would obviously apply to run the race again. But if you know, if I don't make the cutoff or whatever, I would not be devastated. I'm okay with it if, if last year's Boston ends up being the only time that I ran it. So, you know, I feel like even if those even if those last few miles ended up being a little bit of a slog, I'm really happy that I got to experience the race and I'm proud with how my day went. I mean, it was a goal for so long and I'm so happy that I finally got to do it. But going back to, you know, what Alison Marielle Desir has covered in, in her book and in her writing, I do kind of feel like this goal of running Boston and, and running the majors, which is not a goal of mine, I feel like it is kind of overhyped. So I don't know. I, I guess I feel like anyone who's wanting to chase those goals should ask themselves why it's so important to them. And ultimately for me, I was able to reconcile why it was so important for me to run Boston for some of the reasons that I alluded to earlier, you know, like the fact that I want to represent under underrepresented communities and voices. And I wanted to show people like show runners of color and white people alike that runners of color don't just, you know, deserve to be there on starting lines and finish the races. You know, we're capable of achieving and pursuing these lofty goals, too. But Ultimately, like I don't feel like the goal to, goal to qualify for Boston or to do something like the majors. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be like this be all end all that we have to put so much stock into. And I guess that's why it's easy for me to be okay with with being one and done with Boston and, and focus more on on running another PR for myself. And after that, you know, I'm not sure where I'll be with the marathon. I don't know, maybe I'll be hungry for more or maybe I'll want to just focus on bringing down my half marathon time after that. Something that I've talked about maybe eventually wanting to do one day is maybe pacing the sub four hour group here at the Houston Marathon because that was a big milestone for me and the Houston Marathon is where I achieved that goal. And I know that's another goal that, that for some people it takes them years to hit too. With her Boston goals completed, Amelia Benton now has a wide world of running goals to choose from. And no doubt, she'll be choosing what feels best to her. And that does bring me to the end of Amelia Benton's running story on the podcast. Thank you, Amelia, for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. It was such a pleasure to connect with you. And also... Thank you for all of your terrific journalism. If you, like me, want to keep up with what comes next for Amelia Benton as a runner and as a writer, you can follow her on Instagram, which I will link to in the show notes. I will also link to her website. In the show notes, you'll also find a link to the Women's Running Stories episode featuring Allison Mariella Desir, as well as a link to her book, Running While Black. And I will provide the link to Liz Rock's story, which does feature a little more information about the policing of Mile 21 at the 2023 Boston Marathon. Additionally, Rock's episode is just exceptional. A link to Amelia's article about Mile 21 for Runner's World featuring Sydney Baptista will be linked in the show notes too. 
One final episode I will link to is the one that features Mel Rojas. And of course, I will provide information about the panel discussion that I am co-hosting with my good friends, Julie and Lisa, featuring exceptional women runners, Elisa Harvey, Brie Bomer, and Kelly Bruno. On Sunday, April 14th at 2 o'clock on the live stage at the Boston Marathon Expo. And that is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I always appreciate you listening. And I appreciate you sharing the podcast with a friend who you believe would enjoy these stories as well. Thank you. And until next Friday, when another episode launches, I do wish you joyful, healthy strides forward women's running running women's running stories My name is Cindy Burnett, and each week I interview at least two traditionally published authors on my podcast, Thoughts from a Page. We talk spoiler-free about their books, so you can listen whether you have read the book or not. And then we delve into things that you most likely won't hear about anywhere else. The importance of the cover design, why they included various aspects of the story, personal details about both the books and the author's lives, and so much more. You can find the podcast on every major platform and learn more about it on my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. Thanks so much for checking it out.